Be careful what you wish for. The economy rebounds, earnings beat, but now we have to worry about all the pressures that come with that. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, famed investor Sam Zell tells us he's seeing real inflation in all of his businesses, and he's worried. I see the pressures almost everywhere, and uh, I, I don't see what's going to make it temporary. GM CEO Mary Barra tells us about how she's scrambling to get the chips she needs into the cars we want. I think the team has been really scrappy in finding ways that we can build um, the vehicles, not only full-size trucks and SUVs, but also our electric vehicle programs. And New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy talks about the taxes coming our way. We are the quintessential middle-class state, uh, and we want to regain that mantle. This week, we got more signals that the economy is roaring back from indications of GDP growth over 10% for the quarter and maybe 8% for the year. I'm expecting growth to be at a better rate than what we have seen so far. And earnings that were so good that they raised questions about the analysts who underestimated them, driven in one way or another by the authorities opening the economy back up. Broadway tickets go on sale today at 100% capacity for theaters. The shows open September 14th. But then the jobs numbers for April came in way below what anyone was expecting. Under normal circumstances, that would be a great month. We still have a, ste a steep climb. We still have ways to go. Which may be a blip, but there were other storm clouds on the horizon, with supply chains overwhelmed. We're having regular conversations with the administration and members of Congress to find the right solution. A growing fear of increased taxes and the ever-present fear of inflation, made worse by Treasury Secretary Yellen suggesting we might just see higher interest rates. And the markets? The markets pretty much reacted to all of the above, with tech selling off in the first part of the week over fears of inflation and higher rates, but recovering after weak jobs numbers reassured on both counts. And the S&P 500 climbed to new heights, with the yield on the 10-year staying pretty much within range, falling less than a basis point over the course of the week. And to give us a perspective on all the ins and the outs, the ups and the downs, we welcome now our special Wall Street Week contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. Larry, welcome. It's great to see you. So first of all, start with these jobs numbers. They were so surprising to so many people, 266,000 instead of 1 million. Some people thought it would be 2 million. Do they tell us anything beyond this one data point? I think it's hard to interpret. My sense is that it's got a lot to do with the emerging labor shortages that we're hearing about almost everywhere, that managers in many different places are uh, talking about and worrying about it. And if people can't find workers, employment can't, employment's got to go up. Evidence for that is that we really had an extremely strong average hourly earnings print this month. Now, it's only one month, and they were down uh, last month, but they were up at a 9% annual rate. Uh, this month, and probably the figure was artificially held down by the fact that most of the new jobs were in low-wage sectors like uh, restaurants. So I think what we're seeing is more and more evidence of labor shortage, and maybe that'll prove to be transitory. Maybe it'll turn out that as people go back to school, um, more and more people come into the workforce and will lose that sense of labor shortage. But as I look at the data, I see much stronger evidence that people who retired over the last year aren't coming back. I see more and more evidence that people who, in one way or another, have changed around their lives aren't uh, coming back for a while. So I expect that as the economy grows rapidly, as everybody thinks it's going to over the next few months, that that labor shortage problem is going to grow, that that's going to be putting more and more pressure on wages, and that's ultimately going to move into uh, prices. So I actually think there's reason to think that inflation might even accelerate from where it is this summer, rather than the deceleration 
that the Fed and the Treasury are so confidently predicting. You know, it's further evidence for that view to look at the housing market. You see the prices of housing uh, rising at incredible mid, you know, double-digit rates in the teens. That probably is telling you that rents are going to be going up before long. Uh, that's why people are buying these houses in part. That's certainly why private equity is buying up a large amount of houses. And right so far, rental factor has been holding down the inflation indices, and that's about to change. So between the inventory issues, the labor shortage issues, the rental uh, issues, uh, I have to say that my concerns about inflation are increasing. Are we contributing to it in part by keeping people on the sidelines because of how much we're reimbursing them for being unemployed? That's something that both President Biden addressed this week and Secretary of the Treasury Yellen did. They were both asked pointedly, you're paying people a lot of not to work. Is that making the situation worse? Both of them thought that's not the problem. They think it's more a matter of having to stay home to take care of kids or elderly relatives. What do you make of that? Respectfully, uh, I think it is close to self-evident that the fact that people are being paid more to stay at home than they would be to work in millions of cases is reducing the available supply of labor. I think the fact that the fraction of the unemployed who are getting unemployment insurance is at record highs is contributing to people being more picky about jobs. You can argue that it's really important relief. You can argue that it's really important uh, insurance that we're providing. But I don't see how one can plausibly say that paying people more to not work than to work is having no effect on the availability of uh, workers. And I think we just need to recognize that. It may, probably was the right thing to do when we really wanted people to be very careful to stay home and not spread COVID. And so when these very generous kinds of unemployment insurance provisions were put in a year ago, I thought it made good sense precisely because we wanted to stop the transmission of the disease. But I think it's very hard to justify and rationalize them uh, right now. And I would rather see the strong impulse that the administration has, and they're absolutely right about this, uh, to support working families channeled into things like the child tax credit rather than payments that reward the decision not to work and reward it more generously than the decision to work. Larry, as a macroeconomist, are you concerned at all that our models might not really let us know where we are? If we're driving the car too fast, is the speedometer working? Because we haven't seen this sort of phenomenon perhaps ever in the history of our economy. Uh, and let's be frank, the jobs numbers came in very different from what economists thought they were going to be. At the same time, we never saw the economy go down that fast, come back that fast, and goodness knows with all the monetary and fiscal stimulus, do we really have a model that tells us where we are and where we're going? What we're seeing in markets is that because the Fed is so clear about its reluctance to raise rates, um, you're seeing very little movement in nominal rates. But under the surface, you're seeing a reduction in real interest rates and an increase in the inflation premium that's priced into the difference between nominal bonds and uh, real bonds. And we haven't seen a three or four month mm -hmm. movement in inflation mm -hmm. break evens that was as large since these markets got invent since these index bonds mm -hmm. got invented many years ago. Right. The Fed may be very clear about that, but the former Fed chair, who is now the Secretary of Treasury, Janet Yellen, wasn't quite as clear this week. One of the big issues for investors was when she came out and said in response to a question, she said, well, look, at, uh, we may get to a point where the market's heating up enough so that we actually have to increase rates. She came back out afterwards and said, well, I really wasn't trying to predict. At the same time, what did you make of what she had to say? I felt for Janet. Uh, I've, uh, I've been there. People make comments. They get interpreted in a certain way, and the markets get very excited. 
and see strategy where there's only um, innocent economic uh, commentary. I, I don't think that is a big deal. On the other hand, what she said was self-evidently true, that if the economy gets going sufficiently strong and there starts to be inflationary pressures, as part of containing those pressures, interest rates will be raised. I don't see how a reasonable person could disagree with that uh, statement. And the fact that that was so alarming in markets to the point where she felt it necessary to provide further clarification of that, I think points up what is really quite dangerous in uh, our macroeconomic strategy between monetary and fiscal policy. We're creating a sense for markets that it's always going to be let the good times roll. And I think when people get the idea that the punch bowl's never going to be removed until there are actually people dr staggering around drunk at the party, it makes it more likely that the party's going to get out of control. And the older way, which was to kind of recognize that the people with the punch bowl were going to be monitoring the party comprehensively and trying to look ahead, had a lot to say for it. Okay, thanks so very much to our special Wall Street Week contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. Coming up, inflation, inflation everywhere. That's what famed investor Sam Zell sees when he looks at the companies he owns. We're seeing it in, in all of our businesses. It's very reminiscent of uh, the 70s. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Everyone seems to agree that inflation is on its way, with even Janet Yellen this week saying rates might have to go up to keep things in check. It may be that interest rates will have to rise somewhat to make sure that our economy doesn't overheat, even though the additional spending is relatively small. Equity Group Investments Chairman Sam Zell says inflation's already here, and he's worried about it. My first reaction would be to distinguish between growth and inflation. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned at the, the level of, uh, of, of, cap, of money that we have dispersed. Uh, I'm very concerned about uh, uh, the level of debt that we're taking on. Uh, to support it, uh, and so um, I'm not. Sh I'm, I'm, I'm expecting growth to be at a better rate than what we have seen so far. But I don't know what, when you deduct inflation whether that's really going to be much of an improvement. So the Federal Reserve, as you know, particularly Chair Jay Powell keeps saying it's transitory. We're going to have inflation. He says we're going to have inflation. And we're seeing it already, as you know. You're seeing some oh, of the boy, corporate returns. We're seeing it all over the place. I don't think, I mean, you know, you read about lumber prices, but, uh, you know, we're seeing it in, in all of our businesses. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the obvious bottlenecks uh, uh, in, the, in the supply chain arena are, are pushing up prices. Uh, uh, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's very reminiscent of uh, the 70s. So you are an exceedingly shrewd investor. If that's your view about the risk of inflation, how does that change your investments right now? Well, I think, you, I think everything that you're doing, uh, uh, you know, has to include the assumption that costs are going up. Uh, the fact that... Uh, you know, there is a shortage of employment, uh, you, know, you, know, it's, you know, whether it be home building or, uh, or many other industries, uh, they can't fill the jobs that they have. Uh, we've created a welfare society that is really discouraging people. Uh, you know, you know when, when you can make, uh, you know, almost as much or more uh, by collecting unemployment insurance and supplemental this and supplemental that, uh, you know, that's pretty dangerous stuff. And, uh, and clearly, 
we're having trouble getting everybody back into the workforce because the alternative is so attractive. So with a, f a concern about inflation, at least the possibility of inflation, does that drive you into certain assets such as commodities, such as real estate, some of the traditional ways that you avoided, or for that matter, gold? Well, I think that the, the whole issue of fiat currencies uh, is a very real issue. Uh, the United States is not the only country in the world that's printing too much money. Um, Obviously, that you know, one of the natural reactions is uh, to buy gold, uh, which I've actually done for the first time in my career, uh, and it feels very funny because I've spent my career talking about, you know, why would you want to own gold? It costs, uh, you know, it has no income and costs to store, and and yet when you see the debasement of the currency, uh, you say, what you know, what am I going to be able to hold on to? Uh, in the same manner, I think all of the discussion about cryptocurrencies are all in response to uh, the whole question of, you know, are fiat currencies uh, going to, you know, diminish the value and will they be a non-store of value going forward? Sam, President Biden has not only gotten some stimulus done and proposed a lot more in terms of infrastructure and other investment, he also is proposing some fairly substantial revisions in the tax code. We don't know what's actually going to become law, but let's assume for the moment that it becomes law the way he's proposed it. What ramifications might that have for investors? We would say sell short. Uh, I mean, if, if, if all of his proposals were actually implemented, uh, I think it would grind the country to a halt. Uh, I think that uh, increasing the tax burden uh, supposedly on the 1% uh, has never been limited to the 1%. And, uh, and in fact, all that investment capital we're talking about has to come from the 1% or 2%. Uh, I think that... Uh, you know, if we increase uh, it's, uh, taxes at the level they're talking about, I think the eleemosynary world would suffer dramatically. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, we, we don't really realize how dependent we are uh, on private donations to support our cultural, the cultural part of our life. Uh, but when you raise capital gains taxes and double them, uh, as an example, uh, it's going to have an enormous, enormous impact on capital money available for that. In the same manner, uh, when taxes are high, uh, enthusiasm for taking risk goes in the reverse. Uh, because ultimately, uh, you know, every piece of risk uh, is connected to a piece of reward. And if you materialize, when you double the capital gains tax, you eliminate half the reward. So if you eliminate half the reward, it's quite likely you're also going to, uh, you know, eliminate half the appetite for risk. And frankly, that's not how our country has grown. And I think it'd be a very deleterious going forward. Let me argue the side of it just to get your thoughts on it. Uh, some people would say a lot of the gain that's been realized in recent years has been because of very accommodative monetary policy, which has driven asset values up. And then we have fiscal stimulus, which is driving asset values up. So a lot of that benefit has actually come from government intervention. And there should be some redistribution because we do have great and growing wealth and income inequality. How do you respond to that? Well, I think, that, you know, Growth in 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 in, in income inequality um, are, are are facts. The question is, how do you respond to that uh, under the assumption that that kind of inequality is not healthy? Um, one way you could quote unquote respond to it is through redistribution, which is the methodology that the Biden administration has gone forward with. Um, Personally, I believe redistribution is a one-way street going the wrong way. And that the real only answer is growth. And that what we've got to do is we've got to create and, create and perpetuate environments uh, where growth increases. We've got to create and, and perpetuate environments where people want to take risks. 
where people want to start businesses, where people feel that uh, there is opportunity for them uh, to quote unquote, make a spread on, on, on their ideas and, 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 and on their investments. Uh, that's what growth is all about. That's how this country was built. Uh, and I don't believe that uh, shifting to redistribution is ever, is ever going to be uh, a formula that's going to work. I mean, we tried that with Obama for eight years, and we had eight years of substandard growth uh, because there was such a focus on redistribution uh, that we discouraged growth. And ultimately, growth is what we have to have in order to uh, uh, in order to change the kind of wealth uh, disparity that currently exists. That was Sam Zell, chairman of Equity Group Investments. Coming up, we take a look at the week ahead on Global Wall Street. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week, I'm David Weston. It's time now to take a look at the week ahead on global Wall Street. David, the rally in commodities is stoking debate on if price pressures are indeed transitory as being argued by central bankers in Asia. And so policy tightening in the region remains a long way off. Next week, inflation data from China is likely to show faster gains in factory gate prices as raw materials like steel rallied in April. But that trend is seen slowing as base effects fade in the second half. And from India, we get industrial output and CPI as the government ramps up efforts to track new COVID mutations circulating in the country. And from Malaysia and the Philippines, we see first quarter GDP growth as well next week. And the earnings parade continues here in Asia with Alibaba, Toyota, Honda and SoftBank headlining. Danny? Thanks, Sophie. It's going to be a busy week of data. We have both UK GDP and Euro area production data on the same day on Wednesday, but also COVID policy is going to be on focus. On Monday, we have the EU testing its vaccine passport infrastructure. Romain. Thank you, Danny. After Friday's jobs data surprised investors, financial markets are recalibrating their economic expectations. They're looking ahead to that monthly consumer price inflation data set to be released on Wednesday and producer prices, which are coming out on Thursday. Another read on inflation may come in the USDA's first supply and demand outlook for the next crop season. The big question is whether tight supplies that have pushed corn, wheat, and other commodity prices to multi-year highs, whether that will persist another year. And keep an eye on three key U.S. Treasury auctions, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. $126 billion of securities set to be sold in total. That's a significant number because it will be the first time in more than a year that the Treasury's quarterly refunding hasn't risen from the previous period. That suggests government financing needs may have finally peaked. David? Thanks to Sophie, Danny, and Romaine. Coming up, big tech has more to worry about than just inflation and supply chains, as the antitrust challenges just keep on coming, this time for Apple. Apple is saying what we're providing consumers who really want it is extra privacy, concert cut, a security, reliability, and that this is really important to our consumers who are willing to pay a premium. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Apple's 10-year relationship with Epic Games is unraveling in court this week. It's all about Epic's claim that Apple is using its market power to charge it too much for selling its games, and Apple's claim that Epic just doesn't want to play by the rules. Apple says, if you build an app uh, for our platform, first of all, you can only distribute it through their store. They don't allow competing stores, and that's totally un-American and uncompetitive. In 2011, Tim Cook used Epic's game Infinity Blade 2 to show off Apple's new and powerful iPhone 4S. But Apple's relationship with the game maker went even deeper. In legal documents, Apple said it spent more than $1 million marketing games for Epic and even provided round-the-clock tech support for the game maker. The App Store isn't just a store. It's like a studio stocked with canvases, brushes, and paint the tools that artists need to create their works. 
and it's a gallery where they can display and sell their creations. The relationship began souring in 2017 with the release of Epic's blockbuster hit, Fortnite. After that, Epic's CEO and founder Tim Sweeney began publicly criticizing Apple's payment system, in which the company took as much as 30% of sales and blocked many developers from using other payment methods to avoid the fee. You can't have a tech monopoly dominating all, all interactions between consumers and businesses on a, a scale of billions of users. The final blow to the relationship came when Apple removed Fortnite from its App Store last year after Epic activated its own payment system. Analytics firm Sensor Tower estimates the App Store generated $22 billion in commissions last year for Apple from the $72 billion users spent on their devices. We're absolutely going to see some form of legislation or additional scrutiny. So in the case of Apple, it'll be probably regulating the App Store. Apple's antitrust problems aren't just in the United States. EU regulators have accused Apple of violating competition laws by imposing unfair rules and fees on music streaming services that are on the App Store. We need antitrust regulation to return to what it used to be when we protected markets so that no one could dominate and block new entrants, no one could compete against people operating in the marketplace. And so this week, we saw the start of a three-week courtroom battle, complete with the Apple and Epic CEOs themselves taking a stand, along with a whole lot of experts, and no less than the fate of the App Store hanging in the balance. But former antitrust division head Bill Baer and Bloomberg Intelligence senior antitrust litigation analyst Jennifer Ree say it's an uphill battle for Epic's David to beat Apple's Goliath. They have a chance, but it's an uphill battle. I mean, they need to prove first that uh, Apple is a monopolist uh, in connection with its App Store and its requirement that uh, you uh, download through the App Store for the iOS devices. And then they need to prove that the requirement that you go through the App Store actually is an anti-competitive requirement as opposed to what Apple says, which is something that is necessary to protect security and privacy uh, if it's I of its iOS users. It, it does strike me, Jen, that uh, quite a few, what we would think of as tech companies, have weighed in on the side, actually, of Epic Games, maybe the David in this battle, uh, in including Facebook and Microsoft is saying, we find it really difficult as well. We've tried to get in, uh, Spotify. Uh, would that have any effect on the judge as a practical matter? You know, I think first of all, you know, in my mind, you have to think about the fact that Microsoft is a big competitor to Apple, you know, in many ways. You know, they're, they both, they compete in the sale of computers and they have opposing, you know, operating systems. So, you know, Microsoft has something to benefit if Epic wins this trial. And, and what Microsoft and some of these other tech companies are providing is really anecdotal evidence uh, of where they do or don't compete and the difficulties that they've also had in negotiating with Apple to get their own game stores or their own game streaming into the Apple App Store. So it's anecdotal evidence. You know, and at the end of the day, I, I think it has some influence, but but not significant. Uh, Jennifer, there's been a lot of debate about whether we should be focused on the consumer. Is the consumer hurt or helped by whatever is going on in the marketplace? Here, I guess that Epic Games has a real claim that you'd be better off if you're a Fortnite user because part of what I think got into trouble was offering a discount on some of the upgrades that were awful or if you don't do it through the App Store. You know, I think that the consumer question is a really interesting one here because you know, what Epic will say is that Apple's policies are driving up prices, that consumers, hey, this is getting passed on to you, and if developers have to pay this big fee to Apple, you know, this is just all going to cost more for you to play these games. But on the other hand, Apple is saying what we're providing consumers who really want it is extra privacy, concert, uh, security, reliability, and that this is really important to our consumers who are willing to pay a premium. So, you know, the, the consumer welfare side of this and, and how this is playing out, I think, is going to be a very, very interesting aspect. I think in the other thing, though, David, that's been coming out in trial that's interesting is that Apple has not stopped consumers from buying these uh, games or buying the, the V-Bucks that you buy when you play Fortnite to use within the games at a discount if they buy them through the web, through that company's website. Um, 
And then if they pass through over to the iOS and you can then use those dollars in the iOS and you can use that game and Apple took nothing. Apple is doing nothing to stop that. Apple is doing what's called anti-steering where within their own app store, those companies can't advertise that you can buy these cheaper outside the app store. But the fact is that you can and the fact is that consumers do. Yeah, so there may be a way around it, albeit maybe more difficult. Bill, this is not the only issue that big tech has on its antitrust platter right now. We have various government, both federal and state level uh, uh, actions involving, for example, Facebook and Google. Does what goes on between Epic Games and Apple have any ramifications for all the rest of the enforcement actions? I think so. This really, this outcome, which will obviously be appealed, whatever the district court judge decides is, uh, is similar in many respects, this case to the government's challenge to the behavior of Google and of Facebook. We've seen over the years a very conservative Chicago school approach to claims of monopolization. Not many have been upheld. 20 years ago, the Microsoft uh, uh, monopolization case was the last really big one where a plaintiff prevailed. So, uh, so this thing has real implications, both for what courts are going to do down the road and for the debate in Congress about whether or not we need to change uh, uh, the 1890 Sherman Act. Uh, so, so Jennifer, th that's a really interesting point that Bill makes. Uh, one wonders whether big tech could win this battle involving Epic, but actually lose the war if in fact it, it increases the chance that Congress might act. You know, I think there's a serious chance of that. I mean, the Congress is really cognizant of the fact that the way the antitrust laws have developed over time has made it very difficult for a plaintiff to win a monopolization uh, case in court, and that the judges have tended to be cautious and business friendly in their decisions. And I think every single time you see another decision that comes out that way, it's just going to add fuel to the fire uh, to to those politicians that do believe we need to change the laws and we need to make it easier for these plaintiffs to win monopolization cases. I mean, you saw it with FTC v. Qualcomm, uh, right? Where the FTC, I think, did a great job in trial. Uh, it had great evidence really supporting it, but lost and then lost again on appeal. You know, you, you have that to start out. You have the AT&T Time Warner, you have the Sprint T-Mobile trial as well. So, you know, we're looking at this history of, of these cases where the government's been losing and, and the politicians are really well aware of that. And what they're really seeking to do, particularly Amy Klobuchar uh, in her bills is to overrule some of the Supreme Court precedent that has set up these hurdles. Uh, Bill, as you know so well, a, a lot of businessmen just say, just give us the rules. We just want to know what the rules are. And we have known for a long time, we think what the antitrust rules are under, as you call it, the Chicago School. There's a developed body of doctrine and law there. Uh, is anybody come up with an alternative to that? I understand people don't like the way it's going now. They'd like more regulation in some sort of big tech. But what's the alternative and how can a business person or an investor plan for that world? Well, I think that's, that's an entirely fair question. and. You know, the, the Chicago school approach has been to look narrowly at impact from behavior or a merger on price to the exclusion of product quality and innovation. And I think some of the advocates for reform are simply saying, we need to look at the overall impact on competition and consumers and not necessarily require a showing that there was a price impact. Some people are saying part of the problem here with concentration in big tech is the political power they have. How do you measure that? I think it's I, it's impossible to measure it. But obviously, when you see that Facebook or let's say Twitter have the ability to, to sort of direct conversation or even to shut down conversation, I mean, you begin to see it manifest in those ways. And right now we have this whole issue with Facebook, you know, and having banned um, the former President Trump from Facebook and, and now looking at that decision again and deciding to keep him off Facebook. Uh, there is there, there is an issue with the fact that you have companies in corporate America that might be able to control the message. So it's one way that that, that political power manifests itself. And, and I think that's a really difficult question and a difficult thing to grapple with, because in my mind, the answer to that would be simply making these companies smaller or breaking them up. And I don't see that that happening either through court or through legislation. Thanks to Bill Baer of the Brookings Institution and Jennifer Ree of Bloomberg Intelligence. Coming up, just when the auto market wants to come roaring back, the lack of microchips reigns it in. We hear from GM CEO Mary Barra on what she and her team are doing to manage the problem. What's been incredible is the work that we're doing with our purchasing group, our engineering group, our manufacturing group in sales and marketing, and working with suppliers. 
This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. GM announced its earnings this week, and they were strong, very strong, as the company sees demand for new cars come back stronger and faster than anyone anticipated a year ago. But there was a catch. A combination of a surging economy and a huge uptick in demand for consumer electronics has led to a dire shortage of microchips. And it turns out you can't make a car these days without some pretty sophisticated computers built right into those cars. We asked GM Chairman and CEO Mary Barra how she's managing a problem that will cost her up to $2 billion this year. There's not a lot of transparency between uh, the different automakers of what's happening. We're focused on GM, and I think what's been incredible is the work that we're doing with our purchasing group, our engineering group, our manufacturing group, and sales and marketing, and working with suppliers. You know, we've been working to build strong relationship with our suppliers for many, many years now. And there's just a team that is looking, understanding what chips are we going to have access to, how do we allocate those to our highest demand and, and, and products that we have limited or no ability to recover because there's just such strong demand. We run those um, manufacturing operations uh, around the clock. And they're, they're just being creative and doing what engineers do of problem solving and, and uh, in some cases, re-engineering to get uh, the chips to um, the right products and to just um, find every opportunity we can to build a car, truck or crossover and get it to the customer. So it's a mixed question, not just of the vehicles you sell, but also where you direct your chips, it sounds like. You want to direct it to the ones that really are the most important. Do, are you getting more chips, do you think, than you would have expected because of your purchasing department? Well, again, there's not a lot of transparency to say more than. Uh, you know, we were very uh, clear uh, last year of what we thought the demand was going to be this year and the chips that we had ordered. And so, you know, we're continuing to work with the supply base on that. And uh, again, but it's, I think it's looking for every opportunity and, and managing it centrally and also working uh, hand in hand with our JV in China. So, uh, across the board, we are um, just uh, really being, I, I think the team is being really scrappy and finding ways that we can build um, the vehicles, not only full-size trucks and SUVs, but also our electric vehicle programs. And I think it's important to note that even with the challenges of the semiconductor sh uh, shortage, there is no impact on our electric vehicles, on our autonomous vehicles, and the growth initiatives that we've been talking about this first quarter. That was one of the questions I had, both for the Hummer that's coming out later this year and then the Lyric, which is coming out or sometime in the first half of next year. Is there going to be any delay because of the chip problem? Absolutely not. And I can tell you those vehicle programs are on track and uh, I'm really excited to have uh, customers get in those vehicles and drive them because I think they're going to be amazed. Uh, it, it, we understand the $1.5 to $2 billion number that was put up before, but can you give us some sense, those of us who don't understand the supply chain, if you had 100 percent of the chips you needed, what percentage are you getting now? Are you running at 50 percent, 75 percent? You know, uh, it's it's a very dynamic situation, and so, uh, you know, again, I think it's every chip we have access to, we're making sure it gets into the vehicles where we have really strong customer demand, but it's something that changes every day, David, so I'm not going to put a number on it. Uh, this problem isn't going away in the sense that, uh, as you go forward, you're going to make more and more cars that are going to require more and more chips. What is the longer-term solution to this so we don't have this, this sort of problem you have this year? Well, I think we are going to see recovery. We think Q2 will be uh, the weakest for the year. We'll see some recovery in Q3, Q4. Uh, and we're working on a lot of long-term strategies. I don't have anything to share right now, but uh, there's a, 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 you know, a whole um, menu of things that we're working on, processes that we're changing. Um, so more to come later in the year of how we'll make sure we're never in this situation again. But believe me, we have a dedicated team working on that as well. Uh, when it comes to batteries, you've sort of vertically integrated as it were, with the joint venture where you're making your own batteries. Is there something like that, perhaps, that would make sense for GM? You know, I'm not going to take anything off the table. We're going to look at what uh, what we can do to make sure that we have the right number of automotive grade chips, uh, and that we it, it it doesn't constrain our growth because we see huge opportunity not only with the product portfolio we have today, but with the strong electric vehicle products that we have coming. Uh, we hear some in Washington, both the Commerce Secretary and also I talked to one of your Michigan representatives yesterday, Haley Stevens, who suggested perhaps there needs to be some co-investment from the government as well as the private sector in chip production. Does that make sense from your point of view? 
I think making sure we have a, a, a secure supply chain um, at, for the growth that I think we're going to see, I think it's something that we all have to work together on. And we're having regular conversations with the administration and members of Congress to find the right solution. And uh, we'll continue to do that. That was GM Chairman and CEO Mary Barra. Coming up, the tax man cometh. We hear from New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy on the inevitability of taxes to pay for what we've been through and what it could mean for his state. We want to protect the middle class at every turn. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. I think if we look back over the arc of history, though, fundamentally, taxes have not been the primary driver for economic or market performance. Our sense is that there will be uh, tax changes. They'll probably be pared back from uh, some of the proposals. There are potential changes in tax law, including in, in um, estate uh, uh, changes. There are a lot of concerns, but there's also still a lot of uncertainty today. We've been through a year-long health and economic crisis, putting pressures on our governments like few have ever seen. But things appear to be coming back, and now we have to think about how we're going to pay the bills. New Jersey is one of the states hit hardest by the pandemic and already has one of the highest tax rates in the country. So we asked its governor, Phil Murphy, what paying those bills may mean for taxpayers. Listen, we, we presented a budget uh, six weeks ago that had zero increases in taxes and fees. We want to protect the middle class at every turn. We are the quintessential middle class state, uh, and we want to regain that mantle. We believe we're America's number one state to raise a family, and that includes ma making sure that the value proposition works for families, particularly young families who are considering moving here or staying here. Uh, I was gratified to see the census numbers last week. Uh, we were the number one state in America in terms of the amount by which we exceeded the estimate that was put out last year. That's for a reason. People are coming here to raise their family. We got to make sure that we, we continue to have the number one schools, quality of life, great transit, but also that the value proposition works. In the census that just came out, there was a, a, a migration toward Florida, toward Texas, toward some lower taxing states. How conscious are you of that as you set your budgets? How concerned are you that New Jersey could really lose some of the more affluent, in particular, to places like Florida? Well, listen, uh, New Jersey's population grew over 5% over the course of the decade. Uh, again, the, 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 the space we occupy is that that moniker, which we don't take lightly, America's number one state to raise a family. We have the number one public education system in America, top handful of health care system, a location second to none. We're fixing uh, transit. Uh, the quality of life is exceedingly high. I'm proud of the values that we have, whether it's gun safety or women's uh, reproductive rights, you, you name it. So that's our value proposition. Some states come at you and say, listen, we want you to move here because we have low taxes. Um, that's, that's their, that may be their value proposition. Ours is a much more holistic and broader one. You're de redefining a beer chaser in the state of New Jersey, as best I understand. It. It's not following a shot of vodka or of whiskey. It's following a shot of vaccine. Why are you doing that? Uh, a shot and a beer. Uh, it's part of our Operation Jersey Summer proactive outreach to fill out our objective to get 4.7 million New Jerseyans fully vaccinated by the end of June. You know, we had a supply demand imbalance for many months. We had far more demand than supply. Like the Biden team has done a terrific job. We knew we'd come to this moment and we're here. Uh, that balance has now started to slip the other direction. And so we need a whole series of steps. The Shot in the Beer is one of 10 or 12 different initiatives that we've launched to get into every corner of the state, uh, knocking on doors, mobile vans. Uh, we've got something grateful for the shot going from church services on Sunday to go get vaccinated uh, because we think we need to be in a proactive mindset to, to meet our objective. 
So, so Governor, uh, you have some carrots you can give out. You want to persuade and things. Are there any sticks? And let me be specific about one of them in particular. What about, as they call them, vaccine passports, which would allow you to do certain things or not, depending on whether you have it? I'm open to it, David, but I have mixed emotions. Uh, sadly, back to your prior question, uh, a lot of, if not all, government-issued IDs uh, tend to have a disproportionate um, discrimination, even if un unintended, against communities of color. So, for instance, if right now we started issuing these uh, vaccine passports and, and, and accepting my comments that the, the pursuit of equity in the vaccine rollout is not where we need it to be, uh, that's even unintentionally, that's discriminating. I'm open-minded to it, but boy, I'd rather wait till we achieve our objectives and we get to that equity that we are striving to get to. That was New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy. Finally, one more thought. Adding a new letter to the C-suite. First it was CEO, then CFO, and CIO, and CTO, and CDO. But what about CHO? It's all about climate these days, from President Biden putting climate at the very top of his agenda. The climate crisis is not our fight alone, it's a global fight. To companies like AB InBev, linking how much interest they pay to whether they accomplish greenhouse gas emissions goals. To investors like Sam Zell, just not investing in oil and gas anymore at all because the risk reward has shifted in the wrong direction. Oil and gas is not priced to reflect the risk. Pretty much everyone agrees that we're seeing and feeling the effects of climate change in the weather. And it turns out that the biggest source of death from weather in the United States isn't hurricanes or tornadoes, it is heat. Which takes us to that new member of the C-suite, the chief heat officer. Miami-Dade County has just appointed its first ever CHO, and Athens and Freetown Sierra Leone are soon to follow. Jane Gilbert is Miami-Dade's interim CHO, working on ways to protect the most vulnerable populations from heat, creating things like resilience hubs where people can go to cool off when they need to, and working with employers to protect workers out in the noonday sun in fields or in construction sites. She even wants to start naming and ranking heat waves the way we do storms, complete with early warning systems. So, maybe coming soon to an eyewitness news near you, we may well have the Doppler 3000 heat map. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston, this is Bloomberg. See you next week.